Welcome everyone to today's webinar and our fireside chat with Bhavisha Sharma. So hi Bhavisha, thank you for joining us. Uh, Bhavisha is a senior manager in data and analytics at EY and helps businesses transform by creating data strategies to drive complex implementation. So in this discussion today, we're going to talk about what it actually means to be a data analyst. Why is it important? I hope everyone knows why data is important, but we'll dig a bit deeper into that. Uh, the kind of careers you can is available in data, which is quite broad. Um, what data analysts actually do, so starting at, at a grad level, what would a data analyst do? And then getting up to a, a senior manager director level to where Bavisha is. And importantly, what you can be doing right now to land your first job as a data analyst. I am Jared Holland and I'm the co-founder of Outcome.life and I'm joined by my business partner, Dominic Saparito. Thanks, Dom. Very excited, as per <laughs> usual. Um, Outcome.life was founded in 2015 with the grand mission of helping international students get career-related jobs. It's why we have a focus today on data, because data is one of the jobs of the future. It's in the top five, um, and there is plenty of career opportunities through data. Um, and we do this through running networking events and workshops like this, and also internships. Uh, we also do a lot of industry-based projects, and we run a startup pre-accelerator for people interested in actually starting their own business. A few of you have already started um, commenting in the chat at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please, if you've got any questions, ask them as we go. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, Dom will be there eagerly reading them all, and uh, we will try and get through them all as well as we go um, to, um, on the topics that you're interested in. I would next like to acknowledge Study New South Wales. Um, Study New South Wales is supporting and sponsoring this webinar series. Uh, for those that don't know, the New South Wales government established Study New South Wales in 2014 to improve the quality and experience for international students while studying in New South Wales. And they also um, have an aim to recognise their contributions to the community, uh, which we know is extremely valuable. International students are really important stakeholders and members of our community. Study New South Wales is a dedicated unit uh, within the New South Wales government and they have a 10-year international education strategy outlined in the Industry Action Plan to position New South Wales as a key leader in international education and to launch global careers. There's four main functions. One is marketing, promotion and research. Two, development of policy and advocacy to enhance the competitiveness for international education in New South Wales. Importantly, to deliver on the evaluation of strategies and programs to improve the experiences for international students. And finally, the identification and generation of international market development opportunities and new technology-enabled models of delivery. I'm sure everyone in the last few months has been exposed to more technology-enabled delivery um, as COVID-19 has forced the industry to do so. Uh, importantly, in dealing with the objective around student experience, Study New South Wales has been working tirelessly to ensure international students feel supported during the current pandemic um, and empowering students to come out the other side very well prepared to advance their careers. Uh, we appreciate this period of lockdown has been stressful for everyone, particularly international students, when you're so far away from home um, and don't have the same support networks if you're in your hometown. Um, having said that, there is enormous opportunity that comes with a situation like we're in if you're prepared to adapt, adapt a positive mindset and make the most out of the situation. The world will return to normal and there's going to be lots of demand for talent as we come out of this pandemic. So with that in mind, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Bhavisha Sharma and he's able to join us and we're going to share some insights in a career as a data analyst. A little bit of background about Bavisha before I hand over to, to start some um, conversation with her is that she has 13 years experience and now manages a high performing team at Ernst & Young where Bavisha's clients, anyone who's worked in Big Four, Dom and I have, you understand that clients are extremely demanding and so it's really important that Bavisha creates a value uh, where stakeholders are being managed and, manage, and she also manages a culture of continuous improvement. Bavisha helps businesses achieve operational efficiency by leveraging appropriate drivers for technology uplift, which are going to explore during this discussion today. And notice how we talk about technology uplift when we're talking about data. Bavisha has a master's in computer applications and is currently pursuing an MBA at Melbourne Business School. I personally really like that Bavisha has a background in IT, being in uh, the computer applications and also pursuing a business degree 
because both those backgrounds tie really heavily into data. Some more interesting information about Bavisha is that she loves adventure sports, so jumping out of planes and jumping off bridges, one with a parachute and one with a rope. And yep. she also loves spending time swimming, playing tennis, and taking her children for a bike ride. That's enough from me. I've been talking too long. So welcome, Bavisha. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. And, and firstly, I'd just like to ask, how are you and how are you handling the, the COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in? So thanks, Gerard, and thanks for having me at this webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would say that it's been a journey of ups and downs. Um, initially, it was uh, I could balance my professional and personal life uh, together while working from home, so it was smooth. And then as different challenges got thrown at us as a family in terms of managing our time well, we just had to adapt ourselves, just like you said, and find out different ways to be more efficient across homeschooling and work. But now that we're at the other end of the tunnel and we can finally see some light, it's good to see some restrictions ease off so that we can get back into some of our normal routine, if not everything. But yes, it's been an experience and it's taught us as a family how to adapt in different ways in this ever-changing environment. How have you found becoming a teacher at home? Oh, it's been a very interesting journey. I think the most important thing which we've learned is the respect for teachers. It's grown magnificently over the last two months. The enormous amount of effort that they put, which they put in in preparation and for us to be able to make sure the children rule, learn the right ways. Um, it's so important. I think I've absolutely enjoyed it. And my daughter has enjoyed it too, learning and getting that much of time and attention from me. So it's worked both the ways, it's, I think. Yeah, I think everyone that has kids has enormous admiration for teachers now because they understand what they go through every single day, whether it's um, you know primary school or secondary school. Um, but they are they are amazing pillars of our society, teachers, and and what they're able to do in dealing with all the kids that now parents are having to do at home whilst they try and work themselves. Yes, exactly. Uh, your career already expands thirteen years. Um, maybe to talk us through that journey and and, and what you've um, what your pathway has been. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey. So I started in Mumbai as a Java developer after my master's in computer applications. Um, and I worked for a consulting firm. So um, we actually developed the very first cloud-based multi-tenant solution, which addressed um, small and medium businesses um, from which were actually established in India. So um, therefore, it was a very interesting time in terms of learning new technologies and tools, as well as addressing the different client needs at the same time. Now, whilst I was doing that, um, I wanted to do, to do a bit more in data. So therefore, I moved on to information management. And whilst in the information management um, in, in career, uh, we addressed uh, requirements from different uh, clients across America, UK, with regards to profiling that data, creating a golden record for their customer using that data. I wanted to broaden my scope of work, and therefore, I went into the role of implementation management to actually see how data needs to be operated on a production line so so that you don't break anything else if you deploy a new solution which then led on to me managing whole projects with regards to data programs of work regard, uh, regarding data and then also establishing some agile transformation practices to adapt to the new ways of working and bring in data more rapidly than the traditional old waterfall ways. So it's been a quite a journey. And now what it's led me to see is how I can actually form data strategies and governance frameworks for different organizations so they, they can benefit out of it and they can achieve faster outcomes. So it's like a mosaic where in bringing in each piece together to form a view of where I, where I finally want to be. So it's been a very interesting journey, Gerard. Yeah, so you, you started in Java, and I, um, I always like hearing the history of, of people's career because I think a lot of graduates think that a career is like a linear path that they follow, that you're going to graduate, you're going to go in a certain job, and you're going to follow this pathway that's already set out for you. And it's actually nothing further from the truth. I haven't met anyone yet that has followed a career path that they thought they would follow. And people end up going all over the place because once you get into the professional world, all these other opportunities come from left field that you end up exploring. So you started as a Java developer and then your first transition was into information management. 
why did you make that transition? And secondly, how did you make that transition? Did you have to go and speak to your line manager and say, I don't want to code in Java anymore. I want to go and do this. And how did that happen? How did you make transitions during your career? Yeah, that's right. So it's an interesting question because uh, the career was, progression is not linear. So I definitely started with Java, but then I decided as the field was becoming more and more um, interesting for our clients and because I was in consult and I could see on the floor what was happening. And that's where I went and spoke to my line manager. It's time that I explored something new, something different so that it would help me to advance in my career and think in different ways as well because new opportunities lead to new interactions um, and new ideas from a business perspective and technology perspective which helps you to direct your career efficiently so it's i think i think it's a great idea to explore different opportunities and then see where it leads you to yeah and it, the reason why i asked that question is that i think it's i think a lot of graduates put a lot of pressure on themselves about the first job that they that they go and get and it's like it needs to be they think it needs to be their dream job but really it doesn't matter what your first job is. As long as you can get into the professional world and the landscape, you can easily move around once you're inside. But putting so much pressure on yourselves that you have to be at the, the, the one company you've got to go to and you've got to do that one certain role because that's where you need to be isn't actually truthful because once you're in, you can easily maneuver around to different opportunities. Yeah, that's right. You need to keep an open mind, Gerard, to be able to explore whatever what opportunities exist. And therefore, you need as once you get in, you need to keep interacting with your network, build your network of people to see what else you can try out and explore and have an experience around that. So I absolutely agree with you. That's the way to go. Fantastic. And I love the fact that you you brought up your professional network. It's something that we talk to to students about all the time, is that your next roles are going to come from people who you know. So don't, don't let it rely on your CV. Focus on your relationship building too. And being at Ernst & Young, I know full well as to how much you need to actually put effort into building your internal network and your external network. Uh, and it's really important for the people listening today that don't underestimate how much time you need to invest in continue, continuing to develop your relationships all the time, even once you are in the workforce. Yeah. Um, we'll jump ahead to to data because that's where you end up transitioning into data management and now you're working with, with one of the leading consulting companies. But why is data so important in today's day and age? I mean, there's lots of e-book, there's lots of white papers around this about the importance of data in the world we now live in and how much data is available. Why is data so important? Well, data is everywhere, right? So whether it's smartphones, smart homes, or smart TVs, or smart cities, rather. Um, if you have a look at the number of millions of tweets which go out every day, millions of emails, the petabytes of data on Facebook, from each of the connected cars, which may be roughly around four terabytes daily, messages on WhatsApp. So that's enormous, and it's only going to continue to grow over a period of time. So if we really make good use of this data and unleash its potential, it can bring about enormous value to all of or any of the businesses around globally. So that's why I think it's really important to manage this information well and generate meaningful insights to help businesses progress and advance. And that's, that's that enormity of data, which we should actually embrace and actually learn from it and um, yeah, and deliver value. Imagine even you think about businesses and how they operate I mean, I'd hate to think how many emails are sent every day around the world. Like, what type of number would that be? Yeah, so that would be around 294 billions of billion emails, just to quote, just to start with. Every but, day. Uh, again, again yeah. this is only changing as we speak today. That's amazing. How many get, how many get read? Because I know I don't read all of mine. <laughs> <laughs> half. But, with, with all these different um, avenues where data comes from, so, I mean, you mentioned IoT devices and there's cars and, I mean, data comes from so many different sources before we never thought was even possible. Is this one of the reasons why data analysts are now becoming so important? Because you don't just have one source of revenue, of, of, of information anymore. You might have 100. Yeah. But how do you make, how do you make means of 100 different sources of data and I mean, being a CEO of a business, I just want information that I can make decisions on. But how does someone present me with that information when it's coming from hundreds of different sources? 
That's a really important point, Gerard, because data exists in a structured format, a semi-structured format, or an unstructured format. So the role of a data analyst is really to look at what kinds of information an organization wants to receive and integrate it and make meaningful insights out of it. So for someone like you who's a CEO, who's looking at various various areas of business from where the data is coming in different formats. How do you get them together into a data lake so that you can make meaningful decisions for your business? And that's where a data analyst can help to analyze whether any sorts of data, whether it's Twitter, whether it's SQL, or it's an image from which you want to interpret what is the person on this image trying to, um, what that sort of emotion does this person have on this image to then for us to be able to make meaningful decisions as to how we can make our businesses better. So there's an enormous amount of opportunity for data analysts to pick, pick up any of these use cases and then generate insights based out of it. So, so um, when I think about data, I, I noticed that the last um, decade was all about digital and social and mobility. And when I think about the next 10 years and what's going to happen, I think one of the areas along with automation is going to be data and, and getting insights from data. And so I think the demand for data analysts, especially for those international students that are studying um, IT or information systems or information management or want to get into this area, I think it's just going to grow exponentially. Do, do you agree? Yes, absolutely. I agree. There's an enormous amount of opportunity for the future workforce, uh, whether it's in basic vis visualization, using basic visualizations or enhanced machine learning technologies, or whether it's artificial intelligence. So it's only going to grow from here. So it's important for for students located anywhere in this world to keep building on these skills and to ensure that they can be part of a workforce we can, which can bring in valuable insights. So I, I totally agree with you. And it's important to be on top of the new technology changes because that's what's going to matter in the future. And it's going to be increasingly important, Dominic. So, so if I hear what you're saying, and this is in answer to one of the questions already posted, if someone isn't currently studying computer science or IT or the areas where data analysts traditionally come from, you can still get into um, this data analytics field. Well, there are numerous courses, Dominic, online, especially if you look at Coursera or Udemy. So even if you don't have a background, you can still go forward with a small online course, see what, what that teaches you, apply some of those learnings onto basic spreadsheets, and then find your interest. Yeah. Or if you have a strong maths and statistics background, that means you are really well prepared to get into this field. The other way to look at it is uh, to get some practical experience. So if you're part of a university which offers courses wherein they can join with industry folks and then work together to see what outcomes uh, can come out of that uh, of that synergy, then I would really encourage students to take up those courses because that means you get real world experiences in terms of what businesses are really facing along with learning the technical skills. Um, the other way to think about it is also there are so many hackathons around the world which, which universities host, which businesses host. So it's good for students to be a part of those hackathons and enhance their skills and therefore then build that capability over a period of time to address and, um, and learn these, these opportunities to, work, to help them with their career. Wonderful. You mentioned um, the role of AI and machine learning before, Bavisha. So, I mean, my, when I started my career, I think all the data I ever had was just sitting in Excel, and, and that's how we interpret it. But now you're talking things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and concepts that were never mentioned when I started my career. How much has these technologies changed how we, one, analyse data, interpret data, but also the skill sets that, you're looking for in people that, to have a career in data because now Excel is like the baseline, right? Being, being an expert in Excel is like now the baseline because you've got all these other now frontiers that are, that are apparent and that you want people to have skills in. Yeah, that's a good question because if you really want to learn enhanced technologies, where you need to first start is from basic Excel. You need to be at really good at understanding how Excel and data in Excel works and how you can 
you know, generate some basic queries out of data, which is in your spreadsheet and what value you can bring out of it, right? So Excel is a must before you go on to learning, uh, say, for example, uh, programming languages like R, Python, or then even learning how to automate some of the processes moving forward using AI technology. So it's a maturity curve. So you, you need to be really good at Excel before you get into programming to then becoming really enhanced in terms of deep learning, neural networks and, and AI. To, to go back a little bit though, and there's a couple, two questions came through almost simultaneously. What's the difference between um, business analytics and data analytics? Well, it's, I think it's all interrelated, right? Business analytics, how, so we will determine business analytics by leveraging data analytics, right? So if businesses need to analyze how to solve a particular problem, they need, what they need is data. And right. the way you analyze this data is what is going to then help the businesses to make better decisions. So it is inter, interconnected, right? It, yeah. One can't work without the other. So, so it's, it is the same except that the focus on business analytics is for a business problem as opposed to the data itself and the meaning that you can draw from it. Yeah, so you need to leverage data to be able to determine what business analytics can help you. So people use this term interchangeably, but the, but the, underlying, uh, the underlying word is data, which is basically going to help you with analytics. Yeah, okay, cool. Whilst we're talking about definitions, Bavisha, I think another two other terms that I think get confused a lot is data science and data analytics. So if we think about the terms we probably come across every day. There's a business analyst, data analyst, and data scientist. Now, they all have similarities, but they're also very different. In your mind, what's the difference between a data scientist and a data analyst? Yeah, so with regards to data analyst, right, data analyst helps to answer to the questions we already know. So the data analysts will, will ingest the data, process it, and, and give you a meaningful output from it. So you'll ask a question and data analysts will help you to answer that using queries um, or, or you can say um, a basic analysis on Excel spreadsheets. But whereas if you look at data scientists, it will, it will th make you think of what questions are you not asking. So basically it will generate correlations between different sets of data and tell you how one one relates to the other so in the sense if the number of years you put in in your education is five what sort of impacts do you then see on salary does the salary keep rising as your number of years in education rise or then you have to ask the question, it does stop at a certain point, but there's another variable which comes into the picture, which is our experience for you to then go on to a higher band of salary. So it makes you think of what questions you need to ask better to be able to make meaningful decisions. Whereas data analysis is more, in, you can think of in terms of a genome who will answer you the questions which you already know you want to, you need answers for. And, and, and what about a, um, this is a, a, in answer to another question, what about a reporting analyst? What's specific about that role? A reporting analyst, again, will help you to interpret data and give you visualizations, dashboards, meaningful graphs. It can be a pie chart. It can be a line bar. It can be, it can be the way you want to think, you want to represent data. It can be a heat map, right? So, so, so a visualization. Visual yeah, so it's the visualization of the data. It's a visualization of the data. And, and this isn't a, a question that's come from the group as much, but I often get asked, what, what are the, the most popular business visualization tools that you can learn in your own time, self-studying, that can kickstart your career as a data analyst? Yes, absolutely. So I think Power BI Tableau are the two, uh, one, two tools which I think you should start learning in your spare time. And yep. you will notice more and more tools coming in. But I think you focus on one, get the hang of it, um, see how it helps in terms of visualizations, and then move on to the other. Do not get overwhelmed with too many uh, tools coming in at the same time in front of you. So, so if you had to focus on one after mastering Excel, so obviously spreadsheeting is the most important thing and that people should spend time getting advanced um, skills in Excel. What would you recommend as the number one thing that people should look at um, after they've mastered Excel? 
So I think then you should start looking at Power BI. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And then Tableau, perhaps? Perhaps Tableau, if it generates more interest uh, to yeah. you. So you want to learn about different tools, then you can definitely move towards Tableau. Wonderful. And for those who don't know, um, Tableau has become so popular in the world that um, the biggest CRM provider in the world, Salesforce, recently bought Tableau for $15 billion. That's how popular it is. So for someone to know Excel, to know Power BI, to know Tableau, if you knew those three, you could really um, kickstart your career um, in data. Yes, absolutely. And going a bit deeper into that, you might. it's easy for us to say learn Power BI and learn Tableau. The good thing about learning in data is there are lots of data sets available on the internet. Yeah. And also there's a lot, of, a lot of these software applications have free accounts for students. I'm pretty sure Tableau does. I'm certain Tableau does actually. So you can get an account. You can go and dump data off the internet on any field. Like you could go and look at real estate, infrastructure. There's so much data out there off the internet. Dump it into Tableau and then start playing with the data to interpret it. It's very easy to start playing with this stuff. Would you agree, Bavisha? Yes, absolutely. It's really easy if you really want to learn. So just get started with it. Um, you have also a lot of online help, right? So if you if you do not know what to do, look at all the help tutorials, look at YouTube, and I'm sure you will be able to kickstart your way into data. Yeah. I just want to quickly duck back to your answer on data analysts versus data scientists because it's, you probably explained it the best that, that I clicked in my mind, actually, as you said, and I want to clarify it with you. So what I gathered from that is a data analyst is more backward looking. Here's a set of data, interpret it. Data scientist is more forward looking. Here's a set of data, but so what? If, we, if this happens, this happens, this happens, what is going to be the impact of that, if we change this assumption? So being an accountant by trade myself, I think about a financial accountant is like a data analyst. You're preparing a set of financial statements on last year's um, financial year and you prepare the tax and the, the accounts. But a data scientist in the accounting um, sphere is someone that is forecasting forward and playing with all the assumptions. And that is the real insights that people want, right? Because you, then you can start scenario analysis and doing a scenario analysis. And obviously the government has been doing a hell of a lot of this in the last three months with COVID-19. And I imagine that they have a team of data analysts and data scientists that are sitting um, you know, in rooms working day and night crunching the economic effects of what is actually going on. Um, but is that right? Is one's forward looking, one's all backward looking? Is that a simple way for me to think about it? Yes, so yes, that's absolutely right. Because how it moves in, in the direction it moves, it is in descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. So data analysis is more descriptive, and then you can move on to advanced prescriptive and predictive technologies, like just you mentioned in terms of data science. So scenario modeling, absolutely. If that's what you want to go towards in thinking of what your cash flows are going to look like in the next three or four months, given the current situation, then you will use scenario modeling. You will use prediction models to in order to determine how to approach your business next moving forward. So you're absolutely right in the way you in the way you described it, Gerard. Um, there was a question here from Daniela who asks, you mentioned the four courses on Coursera and Udemy. Are there any specific courses that you would recommend? Or, or I mean, I, I thought there would just be so many, you could choose any of them and get value out of them. Yeah, there's just heaps. There's just heaps, Dominic. And I think um, have a look at um, some of the ratings there on the best ones for machine learning or for data analysis or for data science um, and, and pick up pick up a smaller one just to, you know, get get your experience around it versus taking a very long course duration which runs for months and then when when you're interested you keep building on to it so there's i wouldn't recommend a specific one my idea is to start small and then keep enhancing your knowledge if your interest keeps building around around data and i think bavisha i know you've mentioned to me um, before when we've caught up that knowing end-to-end -end in data is really important you don't just want to specialize in one part of data and what i mean by end-to-end -end is that there's a term junk in, junk out, right? So that at the start, you've got to know that you're getting a good data coming in. But if you can understand how a MySQL database works, you've got a bit of an understanding how Python or R works. Then you've got an understanding how maybe some middleware works. You've got an understanding how Tableau works, how Power BI works. 
And my understanding is the reason why that's really important is that when you're dealing with a certain part of data through that pipeline, if you know where it's come from, you can better interpret the data you've got. Whereas if you're very siloed, you're actually at a disadvantage without knowing how that pathway of data, either going forward or going backwards, actually works. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. That's right, Gerard. It's really important to know the journey your data for your data. So this is the problem which a lot of big organizations face. The data are in siloed systems, which means you cannot join them and you do not know the data provenance. You do not know how data moves from one point to the other. And it becomes extremely tedious with a lot of cost and effort involved to even generate any sort of information out of it. So therefore, like just like you mentioned, it's important to know what sort of tools you can leverage at different points in your data journey, whether you need to put in a hat for an analyst to actually analyze your source data or the system in which the data record decides what you call as a system of record. Or then you need to think of the tool which, are, which can help you to process and bring in better data quality to then think of when, when the data reaches your visualization board, how do you want the data to appear? And then think of tools like Power BI and Tableau. So think of data as a journey from start point to the end, and then see what technologies you can use to be able to make meaning out of it. Um, yeah. the, the, there's another question from Prarafsa, who asks, is Python important in her career path? It's becoming one of the very popular languages um, and therefore it's really important if you want to go into the field of data to learn Python, especially if you want to go towards data modeling, uh, prediction uh, modeling, scenario modeling kind of. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think and, my, and sorry to cut you off there, Don, just to, to finish up on that, Bavisha, I think my recommendation for what I'm hearing is that if students are starting, are starting in this and they're looking at courses, I would start with a quite a broad course on data that covers off on all these different topics. And then when you, you'll naturally gravitate to the ones that interest you the most. So someone might get pulled towards some Python stuff because they find that the most interesting for them or the most excited by it, or they might get pulled into like the Power BI, Tableau, or they might like, like MySQL. I know me personally, I've started doing a MySQL course on Linda. So Linda is, a, is the learning platform on LinkedIn. And that's because I've got a, I mean, I've got a whole a team of developers that Dom and I employ, but I don't know what they're doing in MySQL when they talk about it. So I'm getting, I'll get fed data at one end. So I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to start learning the basics of MySQL. I'm not going to go deep about it. I'm not going to, you know, become an expert in it. I just want to understand the basic requirements of MySQL. So what you talked about before, understanding the pathway of data, I can start visualizing my own mind when I'm talking to our developers. I actually understand what they're talking about when it comes to MySQL. So I just want to quickly round off that, that I think anyone starting out in this, I think finding one of these broader courses that covers the journey of data would be a great place to start and then specialise after that. Yeah. And um, a really good question came up, which is close to my heart, being a you know, former chartered accountant. Um, a lot of accountants are really struggling to get jobs these days because accounting, it, it's not as needed as it once was. And I think that... There was a question here saying, I'm a fresh graduate, what can I get out of a data anal uh, analyst course and link it to accounting? I couldn't think of anything better for an accountant to do to have an extra feather in their cap in trying to get a job than bolting on what they've learnt in accounting with, uh, with data. Uh, do, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree. I think data can be used in any any. Um, business and in any area of business. So, um, if you have a if you have a background in accounting, but you want to learn data skills, it's going to be an advantage because now, when you think of some scenario modeling in terms of accounting cash flows, right, um, you will be able to easily leverage the right tools and technologies to make more meaning out of it. So, I think. No matter what you've done in your past, um, data is a skill in data is always going to be of benefit uh, moving forward in your career. So I agree. Yeah. I agree to your um, to your answer there, uh, Dominic, in the sense that you you can relate a field of accounting to data, or in fact, any other skill you want to relate to data because it's yeah. everywhere. And for yeah. the person that asked that question in accounting, oh. I think this is a good way to, to explain what's happening for accountants in that when I started as a graduate um, at an accounting firm, my title was a graduate accountant. 
and then I became a senior accountant. It was all about the accounting was actually in my title. They don't have accountants in their titles anymore at the, uh, at the big accounting firms in the middle market. They're actually called analysts. And they changed that. That happened about eight, nine years ago where they changed everyone's title to be a graduate analyst and a senior analyst and so on. The reason is, is that role of an accountant has changed completely. You do not need people to do debits and credits anymore. Yep. Tax returns are automated, right? So an accountant now is an analyst. And if you're not thinking like that, you are not going to have a fruitful career in the profession. You need to be able to use data. You need to be able to interpret data. You need to be able to forecast and you need to be able to think commercially, not just the, the, um, the traditional debits and credits and tax that traditional accountants used to do. The world has moved on from that. Yeah. Yeah, Jared, and just adding on to that, numerous such processes across in the business are going to start getting automated. So it's just how we use data along with automated processes to be able to make, to, to be able to help um, with the future job. So it's going to be the future of automation and leveraging our knowledge and, and, and uh, the cognitive information which we have along with automated processes to then be able to address the future future business problems. So that's how it's going to be. Um, and that's what the future of Upwards looks like. Um, there's someone who asked, um, it says SQL hasn't been mentioned yet, but I kind of thought that SQL was a generic, more a generic term. Could you tell us a bit about SQL and where that fits in? It's structured query language. So it's a query language you basically leverage in order to interpret or run um, uh, or run uh, queries on top of your, your data, which resides either in Excel or, um, you know, in SQL, MySQL as a database. So you can select some records. Um, you can put up some conditions on top of it. You can join it with some other sources. So it's more like a query language on the underlying data to then generate information. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool which a lot of organizations have um, and utilize and leverage to analyze their data. And, and is that um, part of learning, um, say, Tableau or Power BI? Would you be using SQL in order to do that or is it completely separate? Uh, well, it's separate, but it's good to have the knowledge on SQL as a basic okay. requirement to then move on to Tableau Power BI. So if you know SQL, okay. you're in a good position to move to enhanced tools. And, and is there a difference between Power BI and Tableau or, or is, it, is it, you know, they much the same? No, there is a difference between the two. So one can probably, uh, so there are heap, there's a new, there are lots of differences between the two. But again, uh, the basic purpose is visualizations, right? So again, it depends on the complexity of the business problem, whether you want to make interactive dashboards on a fly or do you want static dashboards? And therefore, which tool would you choose over the other, right? So both can give you visualizations, but what problem are you trying to solve? And that's when you will do the tool analysis. Got it, okay, good. And how important is it, I think you've, we've sort of covered this with, it, with SQL, but understanding databases and how databases are structured and how databases work. Oh yeah, sure. So. So traditional databases are basically in the form of entity relationships. So for, for example, right, um, I'm just trying to uh, think of how I can explain to you in the manner of how a database functions. So a person, a person has, um, a per, um, or sorry, uh, a customer buys number of products. So customer is an entity in the database and products is another entity in, in the same database. And then you join the two to understand how many of your customers have bought a certain product, right? So, so that's how a traditional database, it's got a relational, uh, relational database model structure, right? Where you join information and get meaningful insights. But what's also now coming up is no SQL. So no SQL is the next uh, type of database coming in, where and you don't have to have relational entities in your database, but you put in data as it comes and then use a declarative language, which means a human in, human interpretable language to be able to seek information from a no, no SQL structure. So um, there's a shift in how the data is being stored, processed, and queried. So that's where it moves from an SQL, which is more structured, to a no SQL, which is raw data as it comes in whatever format it is. There's an absolute fantastic question here. It's one close to my heart in that someone says here that they've got prior experience in IT and are currently a soccer coach. 
how can I start my career in data analytics to be used in sport? And the reason why I love this question is that, is that people have passions and, and yet they have, you know, this expertise in, in data and IT and whatever as well. How do we combine the two? How would this person go about that? That's a great question. If you look at sports, right, there are a lot of analytics being used in terms of um, what sort of football team, for instance, I need to create to be able to have the best performing team in the world. So look at all the characteristics of what um, an ideal player should be, run statistics on top of it and determine what will give you the best and high performing teams. So absolutely, it's a, it's a great way to go into the area of sports and data analytics to combine the two passions together. So um, this is the same as joining accounting and data or, or sports and data or, or, you know, literally anything with data. Yeah, there's, there's a fantastic um, show on Netflix at the moment. Called, I think it's called Moneyball, where an American football team, um, they went and recruited on the statistical benefit of every player as a team. <laughs> And it ended up that, um, you know, they got to the World Series. Um, anyway, it's got Brad Pitt in it, but go and have a look at that. Um, uh, well, Liverpool, uh, Liverpool Football Club, Dom, is very similar. So anyone that follows the, the Premier League, or I'm a big Liverpool supporter, but Jurgen Klopp brought in data scientists into Liverpool Football Club because the Boston Red Sox owns Liverpool Football Club. Uh. So baseball is an extremely analytical sport. They've had um, data analysts and scientists for a long time. But they brought that now into soccer where they started recruiting players based on the data. And the key, the, the, the main data scientist at Liverpool Football Club doesn't watch a game. He, he provides recommendations on who to recruit based on data alone. Now, wow. 10, 15 years ago, these jobs did not exist. Right? Yeah. No one had a data scientist in a football club. People thought they were crazy. But that's how quickly we're moving and how powerful data is that – Sport and data is becoming huge. And if you love particular sports and you love data, triple down on that, as Dom was saying before, like double down on what, you, what you're interested in because you will be able to make a living with it. And the passion will come through. When we hear people talk about what they're very passionate about, linking it to the data to back it all up, that's the person employer is going to hire. So I think that's a really good idea. Are there, are there ethics in data? There's a great question from Jose who says he's really interested in data ethics. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so ethics come when um, AI come into the picture. So it's basically uh, what sort of models or, you know, robots will come up in the future, which will be for the benefits of, of the society or will there be potential harm as well to the society? So it's really important to keep that in mind as we learn ad advanced technologies. Um, and, and it's going to be a very interesting space to watch as to what happens in the future. So ethics and AI are going to be the, uh, are going to be the buzzwords we need, to look, we need to keep an eye on, definitely. Yeah. How many of your clients talk about privacy when, when you're dealing with data? I mean, it's obviously a very topical thing at the minute. How much is that being emphasised in the work that you do? It's highly, highly emphasised and it's the most important part of the work which we do to ensure that the data which is accessed it is, is accessed with consent. So privacy and consent is actually an area of work where you can develop your skills in because this is the skill you can apply to any sort of an industry, right? So data privacy, um, the, the leaks which you've seen in the news and the media, which we actually see every day, the millions of um, you know, losses or the, or, or the compensations you need to provide, um, it's, it's enormous. So if you want to specialize in privacy and content, uh, consent, sorry, privacy and consent, that, that's the area I would really recommend you to be in as well because it can be applied globally on, on any business and any area of work. What, what could someone that's interested in privacy and consent, it's obviously going to be a growth area, so there should be plenty of jobs, um, what could someone interested in that start doing now to maybe uh, upskill themselves a bit or, or do some self-learning in this space? I think for data privacy, data privacy and consent, have a look at um, what sort of a what sort of tools 
are being developed in order to enable data privacy to be integrated with existing systems. So just go online, do some research, have a look at what's important when you're defining the privacy rules, what's important when you're defining the governance rules, what are the governance frameworks which some of the companies are following. So it's more around uh, doing the research so, or, or you can also approach in a different way. If you're, there's an industry you're interested in, look at what are the data privacy policies, right? Start there and then see what tools can be leveraged to be able to enable them from a technology perspective and then assist them to drive that, that into their organization. So yeah, there are different ways you can approach this because it's a very broad terms. But I, I would say start, start with one small industry or a company, look at the rules and then take it from there. So if you were, listen, if you were interviewing someone in, in your team, would you expect them to have at least a base knowledge of the importance of privacy and consent um, and be able to have a, at least a, a five-minute conversation about it? Yes, absolutely. This, it's most important because when we deal with clients, if we don't make sure that the data is protected and the and the privacy rules are adhered to it's going to be um it's going to be a massive impact on the reputation of our own organization so it's important to bring that into any and every interview you go to um to make sure that you're aware um and you know how to address this if it comes up we are Barisha, you, you're such an expert in this area i just cannot believe how much you know and i've actually learned a lot i thought i knew a fair bit about data but but um we've gotten quite a few questions from people who i think maybe joined us a little bit late because we did cover off at the very start on how someone who's freshly trying to get into um, data data analytics um, uh, data scientists data engineers how do they get in It'd be good if we could just cover off on that just again, because at Outcome.life, what we're all about is internationals getting jobs here in Australia. And I can't think of a, of a better way for internationals to get a job here than, than in data, because it's going to be needed so much. Companies don't even realise how much they're going to need data analytics in the future. So if we can just quickly go over again, that if you were, you know, just about to graduate, what are the, the, the two, three things that um, you feel you should be doing um, in order to get your first job? And what does that first job look like? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the first thing I would do is make sure that um, I know Excel spreadsheets and those basic tools you need, to, you need to know in order to start your career with data. And then on if Excel, you already have a math... Picture, just to quickly cut you off, just on Excel... There's people miss people can interpret what competent in Excel is. What is your bare minimum of what people can do in Excel? Yeah, I think you need to apply at least your basic, um, you know, summations um, or basic functions of Excel. Um, use some of the um, some of the really important data data tools or data. Um, add-ins which come in with Excel. Try using them and see what results you get. Try generating some graphs based on based out of, the, out of that data. It can be a simple linear graph, but see what, what value it can bring when you can start relating the two data points. So use the Excel add-ins from a data solver perspective. And uh, I think that, that Get, getting that basic experience is also important to get started. And then just moving on from there, uh, it's important to start looking at, you know, some of the online courses, really basic ones from U Udemy, like do a short course and see if you if that generates your interest. You can be, uh, you know, probably looking at learning SQL or you can be learning at looking visualization tools. You can also be looking at data engineering, right? So programming in Python or maybe programming in R. So it's it, it, there are numerous, numerous ways on how you can get started. And I think there'll be an advantage if you have a maths or a statistics background because it's going to help you to go onto your journey much more faster. But if not, then whatever your background is, start with a small course and see if that interests you. Or And also start participating in hackathons and see if you, can, if you really love solving the real world business problems and then and take it. And, 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 and this might be a question from me to you, Jared. How can internships help? Well, I think, I mean, for me, it's obvious, right, is that you need to go and be able to do practical applications. So it's fantastic if you download data off the internet 
and then play with it in Excel, maybe in Python, maybe in Tableau, produce something. But there is nothing more compelling than actually doing work on a real world scenario and producing information, data that is used by business. That is the ultimate in terms of being able to get a job because when you go for a job interview, the first thing people say, well, tell me what experience you've done. If you can grab your computer, turn it around and say, well, I worked for a retail company and this is the insights I gave them into transitioning from a bricks and mortar business to an online business because a global pandemic happened and we had to shut 40 of our stores. That is really powerful if you've worked on real business stuff doing that even as an intern. And so that's how you then leverage that to go and work yourself into a job because you're in the top 10% then because you actually have experience. And, and, and so, Bavisha, hearing that, if I gave you two students, one that graduated with absolutely brilliant marks at uni and one that graduated with okay marks but had heaps of experience and knew how to use the tools, just on that, which would you choose? Well, the experience in tools, definitely, because okay. that will be a key changer to at least get, get that employee into the organisation to kick start. More so than marks? Marks are important, but you're like like Gerard said, the real experience of learning how to use these tools to bring in some benefits are also going to be it's going to be much more important. Okay, so Talk. Jared, I'm gonna do it. You told me not to, but I'm gonna do it. Very oh. controversial. Stop yes. studying everyone. <laughs> Stop studying. Stop studying and get some practical experience. So I don't really mean stop studying. What I mean is that just studying at university, I believe, is not enough. To get a job, if you can get some practical experience, I think that is, you know, and going to meetups and, as you say, going to hackathons and, and participating in things like that, I think that is going to go far greater to getting you a job than getting an extra 2% on your exams in your subjects at uni. Just my opinion. I know it's controversial. <laughs> you, need, you need to have a very balanced approach is uh, yes. where Dom's heading. <laughs> just, Bavisha, just in terms of your team, so someone that's maybe one year, less than a year, maybe one year experience in your team, what does a typical day for them look like? Yeah, so a typical day for them is basically uh, using some SQL scripts to generate information or, or then joining to data sets to see what comes out of it or then actually using the results from SQL to put it into a dashboard and create dashboard via frames from a reporting perspective, showcase them to the clients, keep iterating through them and enhancing them as we go. So they can do new, and also for some others, it can be to, to pick up this data, improve its quality, and see how the visualizations start improving. The others, for others, it can be actually processing the data using some of the programming languages. So there are just heaps of things a new starter can do depending upon your interest and for some it can be actually defining the data requirements of creating that initial version of the data journey how is data going to move from point a to point b so really basic process flow of what that journey looks like great and then as you progress through your career and and you're a senior manager sort of director level that at a company like ey what does a day for you look like so for a day for me looks like um, creating a conceptual data architecture or creating a data strategy, uh, creating a, an implementation plan for an organization as to how they're going to implement that strategy and also what sort of people do you need to bring together what and how do you create a high performing team to actually achieve and implement the data strategy. So there are just numerous opportunities to utilize your skills in um, at that level as well. Yeah, that's great. We are, this has gone very fast, Bavisha, and, uh, and I second Dom's comments before. Your, your knowledge in this area is just absolutely incredible. Um, and I have learned an enormous amount. So I can only imagine what uh, people that are still at university have been able to learn from this discussion. And I, I hope they pass it on to any of their friends that are interested in data because this is a tremendous foundation we have covered databases, visualization tools, sports science, Python, R, Tableau, Power BI, data ethics, data science, data analysts, reporting analysts, data privacy and security, the importance of knowing Excel, looking at Udemy and Coursera, we've covered MySQL, NoSQL. What it shows to me is how broad this data topic is. This is not a specialization at all. 
this is an industry within itself and within that industry there are lots and lots of niches and i think that's one of my key takeouts um the other thing that i think i'll take away is that it's actually really easy to upskill yourself there's so much people can be doing we live in this great world where we have um software or websites like youtube and you have these sites like linda and coursera and udemy you can self-learn over a weekend you could do a 40 hours of self-learning for free. So data is one of those areas where you can do a lot of upskilling and self-learning. Um, it is very broad, start broad, and then narrow yourself in. Um, so maybe before I, I round it off, Bavisha, did you have any other final comments that you might like to leave um, with our audience? Well, well, from me, it's just like keep learning, keep up to date with the latest technologies, and have fun with data. Fantastic. I Just want a job in data, Jared. Right. I don't want to do what I'm doing anymore. So, well, you can start feeding me reports if you like. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe a report on what you do every day. Start with that. No, 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 no. <laughs> that wouldn't be, well, actually, that wouldn't take me very long. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So um, just uh, um, on the next webinar to our audience today, the next one will actually be on LinkedIn and how do you get the most out of LinkedIn. Um, it, we're not going to talk about how to write a LinkedIn profile. We're going to talk about the power of your connections and how to leverage those connections and the importance of those connections. Everything happens through people who you know and through your network. LinkedIn is an amazing, amazing tool. If you can leverage it properly, to actually give yourself competitive advantage and create opportunities for yourself. So we're going to really take a deep dive into how you can um, you can hack LinkedIn for that purpose. And Dive when is it, Jared? When, when is, is it? Next? It's on the 16th of June. Um, 16th of June. I don't know the exact time. That will be a date for it. There is a, a link being put in the chat at the minute. Also, for anyone interested in starting their own business and you missed the last webinar, that was with Paul Breen. Um, and we talked about how to actually start a business in Australia. So uh, I believe there's a link being put in the chat as well that you can click on. Um, it's already been put in there where you can go and listen to that webinar too. How so, much do we love Study New South Wales? And again, thank, yes, Study New South Wales. They're doing a terrific job in being innovative in actually really trying to find, create value for international students. Um, everyone feels for everyone at the minute um, and Study New South Wales are doing an incredible job to do going above and beyond to um, add value. And how much do we love Bavisha? Bavisha has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you for your time, Bavisha. I know you were very busy. Uh, I said you're, you're a wealth of knowledge. I'm fantastic. sure you're going to get about 113 connections on LinkedIn after this. So I apologize <laughs> for that. I think no they're, worries. Cool. they're coming your way. Um, and if people do want to learn more about um, you know, a career in data, please contact um, Dom and myself or the team at outcome.life. And we'll do our best to try and help you as well. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Stay Thanks. safe, stay healthy. Yep. Cheers.